Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. So Fabio, thank you so much for joining us on The No Show. I'm really pleased to have you. Thanks for having me. Um, could you just start off by giving us a, a bit of a background about you and, and how you came to, you know, end up researching what you research and, and what that is? Uh, sure, yes. So I, I grew up in Switzerland and uh, when I was in high school, I did an exchange year in Japan. So I stayed in Japan at the age of 16 uh, for a year in an all boys high school in the north, uh, to, to, to north of uh, Tokyo in Tochigi Prefecture. And really, it was that experience that made me interested in anthropology. I lived with a host family. Nobody spoke any English or German uh, or French or any of the other languages that I, I could speak at that time. So I really, I had to learn Japanese very quickly. Uh, teaching was very different. You know, it happened in these large classes of 50 people. We were wearing these black Prussian school uniforms with gold buttons. It was a completely different world. Um, uh, but one that I, I, I found uh, extremely fascinating, I went to Japan and had this very exoticized image, um, you know, that, that you have, if you, even if you look at the BBC nowadays, you get all these articles about quirky Japan, brass for men, and so on and so forth. But that, of course, uh, wasn't really what the reality was like. Uh, it's, it's really interesting that, that you sort of um, ended up researching um, or, or not researching, but, but studying and, and becoming an, a researcher in anthropology. What, what sort of um, initiated that? I, I, when I, I came back from Japan, I finished high school and I, I thought I wanted to study uh, psychology, but I really wanted to learn something about um, how we deal psychologically with different cultures. And there really wasn't all that much um, out there that you could study, like something called uh, cultural psychology only existed like in two parts, in two, two places in Europe. Um, so I started um, uh, studying um, ethnology in Germany uh, and uh, European ethnology specifically, uh, which is basically uh, what the Germans call anthropology. And my first sort of research was actually on war experience and materiality in the sort of First World War. So I was interested in, in material things early on. Um, and then uh, we, 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 did, we did an exhibition um, about trench art, which were these little mementos that the soldiers made in the trenches of the First World War. Mm -hmm. And they were often quite poignant little things, you know, made from shrapnel or pieces of shell mm -hmm. that were carved into sort of elaborately decorated um, paper openers or paperweights, um, letter openers, sorry, and paperweights. And uh, so that's really what started it off. So I came to London um, to um, uh, do some research at the Imperial War Museum. And I was working together with uh, uh, Dr. Nicholas Saunders, um, who was one of the British experts on it. And he said, why don't you come to UCL and we'll do a PhD uh, together on that. And that's, uh, I find in the final, uh, in the end, I didn't really do trench art, uh, but I, I came to UCL and that's, that's how I came to England. That's really interesting. Um, uh, and so, I mean, having sort of explored um, these different cultures and been around these different different cultures um you you you've studied a, a number of sort of um or you have like a, a different sort of branches to your research so talk, talk us through those so yes i um originally um i want to i wanted to work on hoarding um this was in 2004 so it was at the time where it was recognized as a problem, but there hadn't been, it hadn't been uh, codified or uh, recognized as a category of mental disorder more broadly at that time. And so I was really interested in these processes as well. So, that, so my, my PhD had two sides to it. On one 
and there was a material culture site that was looking at uh, hoarding the inability of people to throw away things that were of little or no value. But I looked at it through an anthropological lens, not a psychological one, which meant um, I was very interested in what, what does it mean to say of a thing it has no value? Or what does it mean to serve something it is of little value? And who makes these decisions? So it's also a question of who has the power to define what is worth keeping and uh, what can be thrown away. Um, so that was really interesting um, to me um, at that time. And I think it's still uh, very interesting because in a sense, um, it's, it's part of the logic that pervades much of society these days, especially if you think it's sort of the, the capitalist background, right? The idea of accumulation as being the ultimate, not perhaps goal, but a, a good in and of itself. And you have that in universities, right? Where the accumulation of knowledge is thought to be the prime object. Um, but the interesting thing is it's not only the accumulation, it's also the circulation. So now you have to do a lot of knowledge exchange. Knowledge can, cannot just sit there. It must be put to use. And the same, of course, is true of capital, right? Capital increases, but then you have to reinvest it. So it has to, if, if you just um, store it up, it doesn't actually do anything. In order to have, um, to unleash its creative power, you have to invest it. And this is literally what uh, Marx um, argued in The Capital. I'm just being, I can see the copy <laughs> behind you on the shelf. That's why I'm going in that direction. But it's, you could argue, and this is really what interested me, is that what you have in hoarding is also a logic of accumulation, but not a logic of circulation. So things, in a sense, they come into the household and they stop there. They don't go anywhere else. So, and in two, yeah. So, sorry, let me, let me just sort of pick at that point a little bit more. So... You say, I mean, it's a very, very interesting um, perspective and it, and it sort of triggers me to think about lots of other concepts. And, you know, just like standard, you know, the typical like colloquial sayings, like like out of sight, out of mind and, and that sort of mm. thing. Well, how, how does circulation um, within the household itself contribute to hoarding? Well, that's 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 a really that's a very good question. That's precisely what I was looking at um, at the beginning when I started my fieldwork in Japan. Because yeah, lots of stuff comes in and lots of stuff leaves the household, and we're sort of we're supposed to know what is be valuable and what isn't. But when you actually talk to people and observe them as they do it, you will find that most of it is actually very ritualized. You know, certain things like you know food leftovers they have to go in a particular bin. And that's it. Um, but you also, I mean, we know from when a new system of disposal is being brought in, like for example, Islington Council here on the, I live on the, uh, on the large estate, they've introduced the, 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 you know, biological, the organic bins. Took years for that to actually work because you need to have, people need to change their habits. They need to understand why they are doing it. And it, it requires uh, all kinds of work. And also it is quite smelly and you have to go down and sort of, you know, put it in the separate bin. Uh, so in a sense, you have to ritualize this kind of behavior in order to facilitate disposal. Now, the problem is that anything that you look at that you could throw away, if you look at it carefully, actually you may discover that actually there is something that you could still use it for. And that could be a number of things. I mean, these are just, you know, random, like letters about building projects around here from the council but they could be they could be used as a doorstop as a draft excluder you can i actually often write notes on them so the the, the idea that this automatically becomes rubbish um is really not something that just automatically happens it's mm -hmm. something that you do to the things and in order to do that you need to understand what they are but if you look at them too closely and you think actually we can still use that for one thing or another then things start to build up very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. So it is in your interest to basically not think about what the value of the thing is. Just get rid of it. Just follow the structure, follow the rhythm, and follow um, the practice that you've ritualized yourself into doing. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. And, and I mean, what's really interesting to me, is, and obviously the link to Japan, is, you know, in recent times you've had these uh, celebrity cleaners, or whatever you want to call them, like Maria Kondo and... And, oh, yeah. and and her 
sort of drive to like make you throw up everything. Is that is that somehow related to some kind of Japanese um, cultural norm? That's a very, I mean, this is, this is in a sense, this hits exactly the heart of the matter. Now, so when I first went to Japan to do fieldwork in 2006, she was just starting out. She, mm -hmm. Nobody took her serious, right? But then she managed to build, and what she really is, she is an entrepreneur. I would treat any kind of claims as to this being typically Japanese with extreme caution, because it is her invention. Mm -hmm. She made it up. And actually she's, she's sort of, um, she's in, in Japan. No, she has a, she has a good reputation, but she's far better known abroad. Mm -hmm. And my, my explanation for that is precisely that because she managed to um, sell this method of cleaning up as a typically Japanese thing. And mm -hmm. that works abroad, but it doesn't work so well in Japan. So the idea of, you know, a thing has to spark joy, um, which I, I don't think you could say that is uh, uh, in any way a, a, a traditional Japanese um, uh, idea. Although it's interesting and, and much credit actually must be given to the translator who came up with the translation. In Japan, it was, tokimeku means, well, it, it excites you. Something gives you a sense of falling in love. So when you see an object uh, uh, and you have this, affected emotional relationship with it then clearly you want to keep it but everything that doesn't give you that feeling can essentially be thrown away mm -hmm. uh, that's just a recipe for you know a throwaway uh, society it's, it's i think one of the things that that sort of interests me mostly about what you just said is is the fact that she was incredibly more successful in in the west in the us or in the uk or europe or, or what have you um, just from from a sort of a, a, your an, an opinion sort of basis, and not not so much has to be grounded in evidence, but just in your opinion, do you think that relates to sort of this um, this um, sort of Western, I guess, opinion or Western sort of relationship with Orientalism and 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 what the Orient the the, the mysteries of it. I think so, very much, uh, because, I mean, you know, the translation of the book is often is sort of framed as magical method of tidying up. So there clearly there is an Orientalist element. But again, I wouldn't say that this is, you know, just projection because she very consciously um, uses that. And, you know, I, I, mean, I don't want to I don't want to criticize her for that. I mean, Mo, she's an entrepreneur, more mm -hmm. power to her. She managed to create an international oh, really? massive business. But also she, you know, she trains clutter consultants all over the world. And uh, actually, okay, just between you and me, I applied for that program. <laughs> um, but, but you have to send a picture of your drawer, um, of your underwear or socks drawer, and to, 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 to show them that you've already absorbed some of the methods. And I, I thought my, my socks drawer is perfectly reasonably ordered, but apparently not. Apparently not. <laughs> that's really, that's funny. But, um, I think... Well, also another thing that I've made a note of here when when we were discussing your your other work before we started recording is you 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 use the phrase a moment of death when you're describing sort of get disposing of of stuff that you've been hoarding. Talk talk me through that in a bit more detail. So yes, uh, in a sense, well, throwing away things if if you think of things as having a social life like uh, human beings do, then yes. When it comes to the end, uh, really, it's it's sort of uh, it's metaphorically um, very easy to talk about the death of things. But uh, um, of course, the object doesn't die. And I was actually I was thinking quite a lot about this uh, recently, um, uh, especially about the idea that maybe 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 we want to we want the object to die because otherwise it will outlive us. Maybe we are jealous mm -hmm. because objects sort of tend to stick around and outlive us, right? Uh, and so to to think of uh, objects also having a death sort of renders them both more human, but also more manageable. Um, and then you can say, oh, no, the object had to die and therefore I have to dispose of it now. Ignoring the fact that you you are actually killing it right? <laughs> if, you, if you want to take the metaphor yeah. to the end. So in a sense, what, what, what hoarders often would say to me is exactly this. It's like, I don't want these things um, to 
to go away. I want them uh, to stay here, but I also don't quite know what they are yet. Mm -hmm. And this for me was really was sort of a moment of when things really came together because I tried to, for most of my field work, I, I basically spent uh, 18 months helping people clean up their flats in Tokyo and trying to, you know, as we did that, to interview them and to ask them and to observe um, how they relate to objects. Uh, and so I kept asking, so what does this mean to you? And what does this mean to you and this one? And that really didn't, it didn't create the kind of um, answer that I expected at all. Um, because I thought the meaning must be in the past, but actually the meaning is in the future of many things, right? Maybe this, in at some point in the future, this will have a use and maybe this will come in handy. Maybe at oh, some point okay. in the future, this okay. will remind me of something else that I should be doing. So there, there's, there's sort of, there's a quite a different way of thinking about objects uh, that is involved often. Mm -hmm. that, that's very interesting. And, and I think, I mean, you, you've spoken kind of in, in a good amount of detail about, um, the value that they they see in these items and what have you i wonder in your research did you ever look at sort of the the financial element of it where they've sort of in their minds think oh i've spent x amount of money on this i don't want to throw it away you know like and and this sunk cost that they don't they don't want to sort of get rid of yes absolutely and that but that's that's i mean it's it's a re it's a, it's a it's a very uh, paradoxical thing because when you come in as a cleaner you immediately think oh my god this is a so much work and we have to get rid of all of it and then the person who uh, is living there they will say no but they, i i understand that most of this is of little value but among the things are very valuable things indeed and so it, it was hard for me to sort of make sense of that statement and so i thought and in, you know, in some cases, it's really the case that they had money put away in an envelope somewhere, and the envelope is just covered with newspapers and all kinds of other stuff. And so the the, the value actually disappeared in the rest of the hoard. So that uh, is, you know, not in a metaphorical, but in a literal sense, uh, very uh, true. Um, but the other the the other thing um, that really happened was that. Um, when when I sort of trying to think about um, what these things mean, because this is what the anthropologist does, right? You talk to people and then they say something and you try to contextualize it and sort of um, uh, to make a sense of it. But often because you bring your own assumptions about the value of things into the situation, you need to often completely rethink what that is. And it's often hard to step back when you're in the situation sort of step back and think, well, what is, what am I bringing to this situation? What, what, what is it that I assume implicitly that doesn't allow me to see this thing mm -hmm. in the same way that the person uh, you're talking to uh, allows it to see? And often value judgments are uh, an intrinsic uh, part of that, right? And so when, when I was uh, tidying up, I remember one, one day in Tokyo, um, it was literally the sort of the, the, the flat was filled up to here with all kinds of stuff uh, you know uh, the person had clearly been also uh, buying lots of supplies and you know whenever there was a, um, a lower price going on anywhere they would buy up bulk buy lots of new things that they didn't really need uh, from an ordinary perspective but when we came to the bottom layer we found a lot of ancient magazines mm -hmm. and you think oh this is just old paper but actually they were so old uh, from the 50s and 60s that you could argue almost oh they have museal value these are mm -hmm. you know th this is a sort of that they have become something quite different in the time that has passed they now tell us of a time that is long gone and connect us to that time um, and that is their value but but don't you think that that sort of just morphs into being an excuse to hold more stuff? Um, yes, uh, you could you could say that, and often that that's what a hoarder will say to you quite explicitly, right? They will say, "Well, I I I buy this now because at some point it will have value in the future." And 
you know, there's there's sort of there's a thin line in often uh, between hoarding and collecting. Like I don't know whether you remember Beanie Babies, mm. with, like these little tiny things that uh, were uh, created as collectibles, and many people invested thousands of dollars in the states uh, buying those and getting a full set. And for a while, they were really quite valuable. But then, of course, there were too many full sets around, and so the value collapsed. Uh, but people who collected them, uh, many of them probably still hold on to them because they think, well, maybe at some point they will become valuable again. So, so the value of object is really something that moves quite uh, around quite a bit. I can't help but, but notice the, the fact that at the heart of all of this hoarding it is still a real sense of capitalism because like I hold it now so I can sell it later. I hold it now because mm -hmm. I've spent money on it. I hold it, I hold it now so that I don't have to buy it and I can use it for different purposes. So it just seems like it's really just a, a, a first world problem. Ah, yes, that's, um, that's, that's a very good point. Now, that, and that's part of why I was interested in, in tackling this from, from an anthropological point of view, because really it is, it has directly to do with consumption. So you have very few cases before uh, World War II. There's the one famous um, example of the Collier brothers in Harlem in the interwar years. Uh, um, but really before that, um, it, it didn't really uh, become all that obvious, right? Uh, so mass consumption has to be present. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a surplus of things. Things need to be uh, produced um, quickly and easily, and they need to be able to enter your house easily. So it means they, they probably uh, are not that expensively priced or they're given away for free, all kinds of uh, things that come to you. Um, mm -hmm. But they must have some kind of effective um, attachment uh, towards you, or you have that feeling towards um, the object. And that makes you uh, uh, basically say, well, I want to keep this um, with me, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't say. Uh, I mean, collector often often think along these lines, right? They think this will be much more valuable once, let's say, twenty years uh, have passed. Mm -hmm. um, but hoarders often don't think in that way. Although, as I said, there's 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 uh, also often there's uh, quite an overlap, right? Usually, the, the distinctive uh, thing is that collectors have a particular particular genres of things that they collect. And they may in and of themselves um, have little value, like, you know, you can collect um, bottle caps, for example. Uh, but then as um, time goes by, these also become quite um, valuable. They can become quite valuable, right? Mm -hmm. Because they, they, again, they change from just an object that had a utility function to something that has a meaning because it is related to a particular historical moment. Mm -hmm. So let's go on to, to your um, other more recent research, uh, the tech of animation. Um, and uh, talk us a bit about, about that. Well, what sort of led you to, to looking at animation in Japan as uh, in, in, in conceptual terms? So there, yes, the, 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 the thing, actually it is connected to hoarding. Because when I talk to when when I did my research, I tried to talk to as many people involved um, in the phenomenon as possible. So I talked to the people who lived in the houses who hoarded. I talked to their relatives. I talked to social workers who were involved. I talked to neighbors. I talked to social authorities. So I tried to get uh, as broad a picture as possible. And of course, what you find is that all these different parties have very different understandings of what is happening, which for me was very interesting, right? There's so a one part of the problem really is that, you could, that people could not agree on what the problem actually was. So from the outside, it clearly was this person is just keeping, you know, uh, piling, stockpiling a lot of rubbish. Um, but that may not have been the view uh, from the inside. Um, but what I found sometimes um, in neighbors in neighborhoods that people uh, thought that you know this particular person believes that the things are somehow imbued with life mm -hmm. uh, that they have a spirit residing in them, and that is this is the reason why they can't throw things away and in a sense that 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 made sense to 
the, uh, the the people who lived around them, and you could see this is a this is a belief that um, was more widespread uh, in the older generations. And when I when I returned to London in 2013 and sort of uh, started to look into hoarding in the UK, I found that there is a similar thing, but it is formulated in a very difficult a different way. So it's not about animation, but it is about experiences of deprivation. So it's always the argument, oh, because so-and-so has experienced the post-war years where everything was still rationed, a uh, lot of deprivation, that's why they keep on hold, uh, or they keep a hold on everything. But interestingly, again, this is something that makes sense to the people outside, to you and me, but it's not actually something that I found uh, hoarders to believe or to, to say of themselves. So what did the, I mean, so, and, and then how did that, so now that you've got this notion that, that um, people think, the outsiders think that this has life uh, to the, the hoarder, and then you go in there and discover that the hoarder doesn't necessarily think that, uh, where did sort of the, your, your um, research evolve from there? What, what did you want to look at in particular? So I wanted to understand, so two things really, I wanted to, to get an, a sort of an inside view uh, from the hoarder's lair and I formulated this in, in terms of, you know, it's not about the meaning uh, of the object, but it is about the future of the object, the possible uses that could happen in the future. So basically uh, the object in itself is sort of an open-ended process. You have to engage with it and find out what it is and what it could be and what it could become. Uh, so that's a sort of a trajectory that goes towards uh, the future. And that was uh, one aspect that I was interested in. But at the same time, I was really interested at how this became pathologized, at how increasingly people started thinking of hoarding as a mental health issue. And that really only starts in the 90s. And mm -hmm. it's uh, partly uh, due to um, uh, sort of the research on hoarding that has been done by psychologists in the States, uh, particularly Randy Frost uh, at the University of uh, Chapel Hill, uh, North Carolina. And that is a sort of, that, that is a, was a bit of a game changer. Because interestingly, especially in the UK, where hoarding before the 90s, I mean, it, it definitely did occur, but it was sort of considered to be, you know, it's part of uh, somebody is a bit eccentric. Okay. You know? uh, and so that, that's that it's just part of that. Um, so it wasn't seen to be a defect or a pathology of the person. But now, if you move 20 years forward from then, in 2013, it is uh, hoarding is inserted into the Diagnostical and Statistical Manual of Mental uh, Disorders, the DSM, uh, uh, the DSM-5, and so you have a very different understanding um, of hoarding now. And interestingly, uh, because I also interviewed lots of um, you know psychiatrists and uh, mental health professionals um, in Japan, the States, and, and the UK, um, it's it's interesting to see that this has um, Again, it's not the, the classification of hoarding as an uh, obsessive compulsive disorder is not really based on any empirical basis. It mm -hmm. was basically because the, the classification already existed. It was all about finding a good slot where we can fit this in without oh, too yeah. much trouble. Yeah. So it's a question of classification, rather a question of really finding out what is actually happening here. And it does, the, so the dynamic has changed quite considerably. Now you can be, you know, you, if, you, if you're a, a, um, a, about to be evicted um, from uh, a rented property because you're a hoarder, for example, uh, you can invoke a mental health category. You can say, I'm suffering from hoarding. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why, I, you know, uh, I, I should get protection because of that. So that's, it has changed the dynamic. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think... I think also it is for me what was particularly um, significant. Let me say about your research is that it, you know we we we've had like the celebrities like the celebrity uh, you know Maria Kondo and others like her who have sort of um, created the really really successful businesses around this idea, <clears throat> but 
I wonder, is it, are there like major cultural differences um, in terms of how people perceive hoarding? Is, is hoarding unanimously a bad thing everywhere in the world? Um, no, I, I wouldn't say necessarily. It depends on your situation, on your resource situation, right? If you live in a place uh, where mass consumption uh, probably hasn't quite reached yet, of course you want to hold on to things because you may use them in a, in a, in a number of ways uh, in the future. So hoarding suddenly becomes a much more rational thing, right? Mm. So it depends on the societal context and it really depends on on the degree to which you can simply replace things. So Maria Kondo, for example, says, oh, if, this, if one thing doesn't spark joy, you just throw it away. Um, if you need it later on, you can always go out and buy a new one. Mm -hmm. So if you live in a situation when that is the case, clearly the accumulation or collecting of, of things doesn't make any sense at all because you can easily repre replace um, any new thing with another. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really interesting and, and sort of it does it does put it into context uh, are you are you um are you converting this research into a book by any chance i yeah i've been trying to my colleagues uh, who may listen to this will laugh i've been trying to do that for a, a very long time but it's really it is like hoarding itself <laughs> one the information just accumulates and i i just need to um, I'm in the process uh, of writing. I always wanted to call it consumed by chaos mm. to bring this idea of disorder and, and consumption um, together. And yes, maybe, but I, I, now, I, I decided I probably I write the, the book on dolls first because that in a sense is slightly easier to handle because it's just one category of object rather than everything. So, so tell us a bit about the, the dolls um, the, the dolls work um, for, the, for the audience who, who, um, who haven't heard of it. So um, yes, I was uh, as part of this uh, uh, studying how people throw away things and how they don't. Um, I obviously find different categories of things were harder to dispose uh, than others. And so dolls and uh, stuffed animals were really hard to get rid of. Uh, and so in Japan, there is uh, sort of uh, there, there is this rite called Ningyo Kuyo, which is uh, a memorial service uh, for dolls, um, which is actually uh, an invented uh, tradition that helps facilitate um, disposal. And so in a sense, it, um, it allows me to focus much more specifically on dolls. And dolls, of course, are interesting things because they are they they mimic the human form mm. they have sort of um you know they have there's an animistic quality to them when you watch a child play with a doll you can see that there clearly is some kind of exchange and projection um, going on uh, but also they have a really interesting history uh, both uh, in japan uh, but also in the west and even um, uh, in psychology itself you know so as a research tool they are a quite uh, an interesting uh, thing uh, to deal with. Mm -hmm. That's really, really interesting. And, and because I think one of the interesting things about those in particular is just, you know, the, the, the intimate relationship, like, like children, uh, especially at a young age in their development years, feel towards these, these objects. Um, so in, in that, I mean, to, to, to me and to many other people on the face of it, it does come across as a, a, a ridiculous thing to have a memorial for a doll. But then look, talk to us about, about how the people who participate in these memorials actually respond. So yes, um, it, 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 is, it is often, it depends on really where you are, but uh, uh, if the, it is, it is not a, it's not a somber, but sometimes it is slightly somber occasion, but many people, you know, bring their kids along, uh, and they they sort of they say goodbye and then they watch the ceremony and then they leave for some people it's clearly a very emotional uh, moment um, but what is really interesting uh, to me is that uh, it th th there is an increasing trend of getting rid of your dolls as a preparation to die and this is it's called shukatsu in 
uh, in, in Japanese, uh, bringing together end of life and katsudo, which means activity, uh, which is a word that's used for many different things. Like, um, you know, for example, if you look uh, to get married, uh, if you're, uh, you know, middle-aged, you do konkatsu, which means marriage activity. So it's something that prepares you for your next stage of life. And so shukatsu is a, is a recent um, sort of a term that's used um, by, again, by sort of entrepreneur type of people rather than the, uh, the elderly themselves. But it is, the idea is literally, you don't want to burden the next generation with throwing away your things. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the polite and the correct thing to do is to get rid of them yourself while you're still alive. And also this sort of relieves them from the emotional burden of them having to, you know, throw away uh, granny's dolls, for example. Mm -hmm. So many people I talk to said explicitly, I'm here as part of Shukatsu. I'm preparing, I'm 80 or 84, I'm preparing to leave this world. And as part of that, I'm going to well, let, let, let the dolls go ahead, you know, and to take that step before me in a sense. That is, wow, that's really interesting. Because I, I mean, I was under the impression that it's, it's predominantly for kids. Um, it, well, it, yes, there are, there are so, some so kids are always involved, um, mm -hmm. but uh, there, it's not really, they are not the main um uh, the main demo demographic uh, 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 that are involved in that and it's that it's really that was interesting to me see and i, I had the same expectation i had the, the idea you know this is sort of at the end of childhood you sort of it's a, it's a right of separation but actually that is isn't the case uh, at all the other thing that you can really see is um is that it's uh it's mirroring very closely demographic trends in Japan um, at large, uh, because Japan has a, a very rapidly aging society. Um, and uh, sort of the average age uh, for women is about 10 years longer than it is uh, for men. Uh, so it often uh, remains the job of women to sort of take care of their, their last possessions. But at the same time, you can see in the, I, I, I've written about this in a book chapter called, I called it the Great Heise Doll Massacre. Uh, mm -hmm. Heise is the era between 1989 and 2000 and, uh, um, 2019. Um, it's these 30 years, basically. In Japan, you still measure times according to the reigns of uh, emperors. Okay. So that was, um, yes. So that was the Heise Emperor. Um, and you can see that in 1990, when the uh, Japanese economy started to uh, contract uh, and collapse, really, after the, the, the bubble economy had sort of collapsed, uh, you can see an increase of these rights. And they increase up to now. And literally, they're, they are mirroring the demographic thinning of the population. So there's an increasing number of older people and uh, increasingly a uh, lower number of uh, newborns and children. Uh, it, it's so, so it's, I mean, I, I think your work, like, and if you don't mind me saying, I think your work is incredible because, you know, Thank you. On, on the face of it, you know, it seems like these are really like um, surface issues, but there, there's such a deep human element to them. Um, uh, thank you for saying that. I, I'm actually, this, this was one of the big things, uh, you know, that, that I was struggling with. Was like, can I really get away with mm -hmm. writing a book about dolls, a middle-aged man, while my colleagues write about, you know, uh, human rights in, in Palestine uh, and, uh, you know, racism in the UK and so on and so forth. Can I, can I get away with writing about dolls in Japan? But actually, when you look into it, um, it's 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 fascinating, and it goes it goes very deep. It goes back to the same existential questions that uh, anthropology has always been um, involved with. Uh, where can people find you online? Um, I, well, I, d I don't actually have an online presence. Uh, I'll have to change that very quickly. Uh, apart from my um, profile on the SOAS, uh, I work at SOAS, University of London. Um, so if you put in Fabio Gigi, SOAS, S-O-A-S, um, it, it should come up. Yeah, I will link that onto the episode anyway. Um, Thank you. Um, so what, what we'll do is, um, just finally, what, what, 
what bit of advice would you give to any any um, young people um, hoping to sort of get into the world of social anthropology or um, just research in, in this field in general? Um, that, that's a good question. Well, there's two answers to that. One is, well, at the moment, higher education is such a crazy place, so unstable. Neoliberal reforms are about to destroy the university mm -hmm. as we know it. Absolutely. There will be new forms of engagement and learning. And I think what you're doing really points to the future. And that's why I'm, I'm hopeful, um, you know, that there will be there, this, the, the, the spirit of inquiry, the spirit of curiosity um, will remain there. Mm -hmm. And so if you're interested in social anthropology, yes. I mean, if, you, if you're interested in what's happening around you, why people behave the way that they do, um, when you even, you know, think sometimes this is really odd, um, then definitely the study of uh, social or cultural anthropology is for you. Uh, well, absolutely. And I think, uh, and just to sort of um, echo your point, I think we are sort of entering this, this shift um, in the way education is, is um, I guess, is, is carried out uh, wherever you are in the world, not just in, in the UK or, or the West. Um, it's just that we've gone through this incredible period in time where, you know, um, education was largely seen as as a as a profiteering enterprise, and um, and you know, now, and um, fortunately now because of the internet and because of you know people are all connected, the, this this incredible work that that like, that you've done and 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 your colleagues and and people all around the world can be shared. So. Um, once again, I just want to thank you a lot for joining us, and I've I've had an incredible time. I, I've really enjoyed this. No, thank you. It, the pleasure was mine. It was really great to do this. Excellent. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video, and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute whatever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.